in guidelines. And then uh, we will talk about some TR69 slash TR143 based tools. And then uh, we'll discuss Zycel solution and what we have done with our CPE to help you as service providers to, uh, uh, to attain compliance with all these tests. And then we have a special guest for you today. Uh, we have uh, Art Lancaster from NISC. Uh, NISC is, has been a longstanding Zycel partner. Uh, we uh, work very, uh, they provide uh, a very broad portfolio of uh, solutions for service providers, including an ACS uh, management system. And uh, we've been working very closely with NISC since last year to field test our solution. Uh, so uh, uh, they will be able to showcase their, uh, uh, their compliance tool. And also we will share with you a gigabit level testing uh, solution that we have for you uh, uh, today. So that's the general agenda. Let's uh, start. So first, the overview. So uh, again, I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but I wanted to kind of, just so that we're all on the same page, let's kind of go over uh, the details, uh, testing details, so measurement and recording. Uh, what are you testing? We're testing two things, latency and speed. Latency is you have to perform one test every minute. So basically 60 tests per hour. Speed, you have to perform one speed test per hour. Now, if there is a high load on the network, then you can retest because again, you have to do this during prime time, so to speak, and we'll talk about that. Now, all the tests have to be reported, even the ones that have failed or repeated, but you have to report everything, okay? So you can pick and choose. FCC doesn't want you to pick and choose only the good ones. They want you to report everything so they can make sure that the network performance is uniformly good. Um, performing schedule. So now you have to perform these tests on a quarterly basis, but you report them only once a year. So you perform for the entire year, every quarter, and then the following year, you will report them. Now, one week, seven days. One week per quarter, seven consecutive days. Now, like I've mentioned, Tests have to be performed during prime time, so to speak, uh, because FCC wants to make sure that the network performance is good even when it is uh, tested or used to the max. Uh, so this is designated 6 p.m. to 12 p.m. So it has to be these six hours, uh, seven consecutive days. Now you can pick whichever week of the quarter you want uh, and you can do the speed and latency tests on different weeks as well. So they don't have to be done simultaneously. Uh, you can uh, pick one week to do the speed test, a separate week to do the latency test. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the reporting has to be done uh, once a year. So you test every quarter for a year and the following year uh, you report. Now, there, is some ex there are some exceptions and let's look. So this is the most latest schedule uh, for pre-testing and testing, okay? Uh, so depending on which program you qualify for, uh, you will have to start uh, testing accordingly. Uh, and pretty much everybody starts testing next year, right? And uh, reporting uh, uh, the following year. So again, uh, this is, uh, we will provide you with the slides and you will also have um, uh, uh, the video so you can kind of review this and figure out where you fall. Now, how is compliance measured? Uh, so the speed, 80% of tests should score at least 80% of the speed tier, which means that if you're, uh, if you're offering 100 megabits per second, right, down, and if you're uh, for six hours, you have to do one per hour, so you're doing six tests. So 80% of the tests should record 80 megabits per second, at least. 
preferably more, right? And then the same thing with latency. So latency, you have 100 millisecond round trip, and at least 95% of all the tests that you do should be or should record 100 millisecond or better. Uh, so the tests have to be measured uh, between customers' homes and a remote server. Uh, so uh, connecting to an FCC designated IXP. Now, uh, this is a typo here. There are uh, this last year it used to be 16. Now there are way uh, over 60 designated IXPs. And Art will talk a little bit more about them uh, uh, as he explains the tool that they have, but uh, this is a typo, I apologize, we'll correct it. So it's, uh, but, but the tests have to go as the diagram uh, uh, shows you down there, uh, from the subscriber all the way to an FCC designated IXP, uh, and the test server has to be around there. Now, um, this is, you know, they want to make sure that uh, you're not putting the test server right next to the house. So, so let me recap. Um, again, test quarterly, report yearly, right? Uh, one week every quarter. Again, the tests don't have to be done simultaneously. So you can split speed tests with um, the uh, latency tests on different weeks. And then retest. So for the speed test, if there is a very high traffic load, uh, you know, you can redo the test. Now the test should travel to the server, uh, the IXP. Uh, IXP stands for Internet Exchange Point. Okay. Um, different groups for different speeds. Uh, so so that's, that's the other thing. So you have to, if you have different speed tiers, then you have to pick a test sample for each of these different speed tiers. Now, if you're offering the same speed tier in two different states, then you have to pick two different test groups for uh, even the same tier because it is in two different states. Now, how many tests uh, sam uh, or how many test participants do you have to pick? It's basically 10% of the uh, the deployed of your deployed base. Now 10%, but it can be less than five, and it doesn't and it doesn't have to be more than 50. So it's about 10%, but it maxes out at 50. So if you have 5,000, uh, you still will just test 50 uh, people or 50 subscriber homes. Compliance is 80-80, so 80% 80 of the tests should have 80% of the speed or better. For latency, 95% of the tests should have 100 milliseconds or better, so less. And you have to report everything, okay? Now all of this, and we will see this, all of this uh, um, kind of, management will be done on the ACS side of things, okay? Now, how do they measure non-compliance? So it's um, whatever is your compliance percentage uh, and you divide it by 80 because they require only 80% compliance. And then for latency, whatever is your compliance, it's like if 95%, uh, for example, or 79% of your latency tests are within the 100 millisecond range, then you take 79 divided by 95, which means you're 83% compliant. And then you look at the table at the bottom and you see, okay, so if it is 83% compliant, then I fall in uh, category level two, which means now instead of reporting once every year, you have to report every quarter and then they can uh, withheld up to 10% of your uh, monthly uh, subsidy. Okay. Uh, so next up, we talked to, uh, we'll talked. we talk about uh, TR-143 for uh, CAF performance testing. So TR-143 is one tool that can be used for, uh, 
for doing these uh, speed and uh, latency tests, right? Uh, and so it's just one of the features. So there are no, um, so as we've just seen, FCC performance, uh, these uh, CAF performance tests are a series of tests and requirements. So there is no feature built into TR69 that will do all of that and reporting for you. But there are features, individual features that have been, that have to be combined together with logic and program and application to make this work. And TR143, which is part of TR69 remote management protocol, can be used to do that. So, so that's, that's important to kind of make the distinction. That there is no specific, just a complete built-in feature, and you do need uh, a, an ACS platform to be able to do that. Now, uh, if you do use, if you do choose to use TR69, then uh, obviously the ACS will handle uh, the, the management. Now, there are other options, but there are white box options, which means you might have to, uh, for, for the test subjects, you might have to give them another tool, uh, another device uh, to do this measurement. And uh, a lot of service providers will like the idea, even your customers might not. Uh, and but the, in a pinch, you have options. And uh, Measuring Broadband America MBA is an organization that can help you do that as well. Okay. Now, factors that can influence the TR143 speed and test results. So the first is capacity configuration of the test server. Uh, that is uh, the server that you are sending all these requests to. Right? So that could be a factor the processor speed on the CPE, right? Um, the modern, uh, modern CPEs use hardware accelerators, uh, which uh, quite often, uh, you know, they are capable of performing at gigabit speeds, but some of the TR143 uh, 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 protocol does not engage them. So it may not re uh, reflect the real performance. The, uh, the overall traffic load, right? And also even the test file that you use to uh, do these tests, speed tests can also affect uh, the results. Now, what have we done? So over the past two years, uh, you know, we've kind of worked diligently uh, and uh, for across the board on all our CPEs. We have started, we have optimized our TR143 uh, features. And the way we've done that is we've added parallel uh, connections or multi-threading that really boosts up the performance. And uh, starting 2019, all our current CPEs have firmware with this optimized uh, TR143 uh, software. Additionally, we've added other parameters, in, uh, uh, TR143 parameters that will assist uh, vendors ACS vendors to manage all of this information and uh, the testing protocol. So for example, uh, they can remotely set the number of these multi-threading operations. They can check for traffic congestion. So all of these parameters uh, we've added and we work with companies like uh, NISC so they can leverage those parameters and build into their system. And we work with them closely, not just to do that, but also field test it. And then Zycell firmware, uh, you know, uh, like I mentioned, all, most of our uh, current CPEs have this optimized year 143. So when you decide uh, to start testing, you want to make sure that you have the right firmware. And then we have made, because this is not a one-time thing, so we have made CAF performance testing as a standard uh, uh, for our entire QA process. So we've incorporated it in our uh, all of for all our products from this point on. So here's a quick uh, this graph uh, or this slide gives you an, a snapshot. So these are the different speed tiers that you may be required or you might qualify fall under. And we've listed all the devices as you can see. Most of the devices can be used to do calf performance testing again. A lot of these devices can offer gigabit speeds, uh, uh, but as far as using TR143 
you do calf testing and it depends on what products, uh, you know, what speed tier and you will have to use a product appropriately. But the great news is we have products now like our Wi-Fi 6 line that does gigabit testing as well. And Art will show you some of that shortly. So here's a quick summary. Uh, Zycel CPEs support optimized TR143. CPEs used for, men, uh, for, for these may depend. So the, the CPE that you use may depend on the speed tier and uh, your ACS. Okay, um, field testing is critical. And uh, so uh, it isn't something that you can just start and will work. I mean, you will have to, depending on the speed tier, you wanna make sure that the, you have the latest firmware, the capacity configuration of the test server uh, is very important and uh, the traffic load. So there are so many parameters that, uh, and Art will talk about that, that you have to set correctly, test them, set them right uh, beforehand so that you can, uh, that you can perform when it's time. So um, uh, field testing, uh, you know, cannot be stressed uh, enough, the importance of field uh, testing for this, uh, for this to be successful. And then once you do field testing, you have data to verify that your line speeds and condition are ideal to, uh, to perform these tests. So we have a ton of resources. Uh, 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 the uh, FCC has official, I mean, they have these documentation that make it very easy for you to understand a lot of these things. They have FAQs. Um, also, uh, you know, please contact us if you have any questions, we are here to answer. And before I pass it over to, um, uh, to Art, we have a quick, poll for you. So, um, Rochelle, if you can help us launch this poll, um, basically it's, uh, you know, we'd like to know from you uh, based on your, what is your current calf testing status? Are you evaluating options? Have you started field testing? Have you finished field testing? And, uh, or you've already started testing in 2020? Uh, some of them, uh, some of you might be required to do that, or you don't have to do uh, until 2021. So, uh, if you could please help us. Uh, Absolutely. So I'm launching the polling now. All right. So far. So, Rochelle, let's give everybody, uh, everyone a few seconds to, so. Yeah, right. Okay, five, four, three, two. No, let's, let's give them oh, a couple more four? seconds. Okay, no Because <laughs> there are so many options, I, you know. Oh, yeah. Okay, it seems like everything is stabilized, so. All right, so the winner is we're evaluating options for calf testing. And, and by the way, these are anonymous, so we don't collect information. This is just for us to, um, uh, just so you know. So uh, it is just for all of us to kind of figure these things out, but uh, we don't uh, try to see who is, sign, uh, who is kind of picking what option, okay? All right. Awesome. So with that, I will hand it over to uh, Art. Thank you, Jake. I'll get my screen sharing going here as well. And Rochelle, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, very good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, I can hear you. And is my, is my slide showing as well? Yep. Very good. All right, thanks, Jake, for inviting um, NISC and me to participate today and uh, looking forward to uh, the rest of the presentation. Um, so start off just as a little introduction to NISC and our user services system, and that'll, that'll be brief. Our compliance solution for FCC 
testing and reporting is part of user services system. Uh, we've been working with Jake and Zyxel for several years in developing remote management using TR69. In fact, both Zyxel and we were pioneers of very important part of that standard family, which is TR181. And um, so this relationship's gone on for a long time. Uh, the company that developed this ACS platform uh, was Affinity, and we were acquired by NISC in uh, April of last year. Uh, it's really been great to be part of NISC. Uh, NISC is a very um, interesting company. And uh, to just tell you a little bit, one is we're, we're over 50 years old as a technology company. Um, we invest very heavily in R&D and we're quite a sizable company. We're also unique in a way that we are a cooperative. Uh, we have over 840 members of our cooperative who are our boss and are our customers um, who manage what we do and we work very closely with these members. Our members are utilities and telecom operators, a wide range of sizes. Many of them are rural cooperatives. Uh, we have some that are quite sizable. Almost all of them that are telecoms are involved in um, serving their subscribers uh, first using an ISC's uh, operational and management software, billing software. Um, this is the kind of software that we provide overall, really a full range of everything needed to operate a utility or telecoms company for the operational billing, reporting, um, even printing bills of the old fashioned way, but we also have some great technology for the end users such as mobile apps to pay your bill and check on outage status and things of that nature with our technology. Moving to user services system, um, it's a full lifecycle management system for Wi-Fi and internet services. It's now fully integrated with the NISC enterprise software I was just describing. Um, which is really a great benefit to our customers. It is a cloud-based hosted auto configuration services platform for Wi-Fi gateways and other CPE. Supports the latest broadband form standards, uh, including the benefit of TR181 uh, is in fact that there's very few vendor specific parameters needed in the data model. Um, it's uh, available in I think almost every one of the Zyxel gateways that was on that prior slide. Um, which has been a key part of how we've been able to provide advanced management for all the connected devices, advanced Wi-Fi diagnostics with these kinds of CPE available from Zyxel with our platform. It provides a lot more than many people expect to achieve using a, a standards-based platform. Uh, easy onboarding and management of devices, important, of course, is diagnostic tools and analytics for fast problem re resolution uh, in care dashboards and so forth. And um, it includes the FCC compliance testing solution that I'm going to go into more detail in uh, this presentation. Um, not to go into any detail on this, we have a care dashboard that's used by support teams that has the full status of the connectivity of that households, internet service, the connections of their gateway, any issues, traffic levels, if there's, you know, Wi-Fi problems, these are all uh, there for the CSR to be able to deal with. Uh, on top of that, using the same technology, we've got uh, with our Smart Hub mobile app, a version that includes Wi-Fi management. And for our members that are using our enterprise software, actually the same app has everything from pay your bill to outage reporting to um, communicating with your operator as well as all your managed Wi-Fi capability. And there's both a web and a mobile version of that, all powered by uh, user services system integrated with the rest of our platform. Uh, so now let me move into detail of the real topic for today, today's discussion. Uh, we call it user services compliant. It's a, it's a turnkey FCC USAC compliance testing reporting service. Um, so this solution has built into it the detailed scripts and automated execution of that rather complex sequence of testing events that are required. Um, it includes, uh, as part of the service, uh, NISC's high-performance test server network, 
This automatically optimizes data flowing from subscriber test locations through the FCC recognized internet exchange points uh, to the test server network. I'll show you more details of that in a couple slides. Tests are performed with standard broadband gateways. This is really a key advantage when you're looking at options for how you can do FCC compliance testing and reporting. Um, a high percentage of cases, um, especially the a high percentage of the ACAM1, ACAM2, CAF2 locations, are 100 meg or slower speed tiers. Even on fiber, there's a lot of cases where you may have provisioned a gig service. Um, so depending on your status of how you're working with USAC in meeting these requirements, the speeds that you test to are actually those that were part of your grant program. And so a lot of those are four by one. There's some, you know, 100 by 20, 100 by 25, these kinds of speed tiers. Then there's also a 1,000 by 500 and a 1,000 by 1,000 that's in the program. Um, so it is important depending on what you used in your grant program. And that's what that um, compliance is judged against. So you might have a gig customer on a grant program at 100. When you have that situation, your compliance level is judged against 100. It's not the current provision service. So we keep track of that in our database and user services um, system for these tests so that the reports that we generate for you automatically handle what's the failure, what isn't. So you can know about that before you upload the results to USAC. I'm going to show you how you import the locations to be tested. Um, you know, USAC will pick those locations randomly at the beginning of your two year, first two year period. Um, it's typically 50 or 100, it's 50 per state per speed tier is the typical case. Um, so if you use two grant program speed tiers and you're in one state, you'd have 100 randomly selected locations that you have to perform all these detailed tests on. Uh, I'm going to show you, we have a simple scheduler for this and a reporting manager and uh, some nice visual reports that you can see what's going on. And finally, and this is a detailed thing, is the export tool with data files that are ready for you to upload. Um, and the timing of these uploads, by the way, it's uh, especially during this first year that you test. Um, Working with USAC, you'll be doing using logging into the hub portal and uploading the export file, um, most likely quarterly. Um, that annual requirement has more to do with when they when you go into formal testing after the pre-testing year, and that has to do with how you get judged for whether or not you have any penalties associated with non-compliance. Let's talk, there were a couple questions about the speed test servers, which ones are, are good, how, you know, this kind of thing. So I'll tell you about our solution for that. The requirement is very specific on, and, and detailed on the traffic flow. Um, and I'll show that on the next slide actually, but we have a nationwide network using a high capacity content delivery network technology for all of the speed tiers and it's uh, got the capacity and performance to do that up to the one gig tier which is the current fastest that's in any of these grant programs um, a thing that i think is pretty unique to us um, i think maybe the mba method may use something similar but as far as the other solutions i'm aware of in the industry you may need to be careful picking the correct speed test server. Well, the benefit of our approach is that only one URL is needed, um, and that's what's put in our execution scripts automatically. Um, and the automated traffic routing happens so that the traffic automatically goes from subscriber locations through the correct FCC designated ASN IXP um, within ISC speed test servers. Same test server network is also included in user services system as our default setting for any speed tests done by your support staff using USS as well as the mobile app. Now those are configurable for those other applications if you as an operator want to have maybe your own Ookla custom server or something of that nature, um, especially for that subscriber testing. Um, but what we found is this works so well that um, our members so far have all chosen as they've adopted USS 
to use the same speed test server network. It provides very meaningful and reliable results and does meet all the FCC requirements. I thought I'd show you one graphic. This comes from an FCC document. I've put the link in the slide that's available on that uh, same site that um, Jake showed in his slides. Um, so the left part of this, including that blue cloud, ETC is basically you as an operator. Um, and then uh, most operators, unless you're a large tier one operator, are working through a peering partner. It's shown as the transit provider network on this slide. And they have a connection at an internet exchange point. Um, you might yourself have that connection directly at an internet exchange point, depending on your own operations. But either way, um, you would just get rid of the brown cloud in that case, and you'd be connected directly. The traffic flow is the same in either case. Um, the path that is most representative of the approach of our speed test server network is the one that's on this slide. They had about eight other slides in the, in the document that I shared of they've got acceptable paths, not acceptable paths. It's a document well worth looking at uh, if you've got questions about that. But our test server network is at the URL shown there. It has a direct connection at all FCC designated IXPs in the US. Um, so as a result, and by the way, that connection happens uh, through the ASN or BGP network. Um, so if you trace route from any given location of a subscriber location to our speed test server, you'll find the hops through your own network and your peering partner to the IXP. And then immediately the next hop is always our speed test server, no matter where you are in the US. Um, and that's path is very important to make sure that the traffic only goes this way to the speed test server. It can't go through alternative paths through other IXPs or other pathways. Um, and so that's why it's so essential to be connected at the exchange point, which our system accomplishes. Uh, I'd like to touch briefly on hitting um, one gig with TR143 standard. I've touched briefly on this because, in fact, um, there, there are companies uh, that say you can't do this. Well, they just haven't tried it has been my only explanation for that. Um, and, you know, there are some key factors. Jake touched on them in his slides. Um, so the first thing is they may not even know what the correct standard is. Um, so the standard TR-143 stopped being updated as a separate standard like four years ago. Um, it's now part of TR-181. Um, some vendors don't even have devices supporting TR-181 yet, so they may not be paying attention. TR-181 specifies this. One of the key things that was added in recent times was multiple connections, which are absolutely essential to achieve the one gig level. You have to saturate the, the traffic in the wide area connection uh, to be able to have the, the traffic um, accomplish the total throughput. Um, so the details of how to count that are specified in TR-181 and the Zyxel devices, as well as our server platform and implementation in USS implement that according to the standard. And uh, I'm gonna show you some examples with Zyxel's uh, Wi-Fi 6 EX5510 um, and both the 5510 and 3510 from Zyxel we've confirmed will work at the one gig level. Um, many of the others will work at uh, speeds that are you know, in the three to 400 range. Um, and as long as you're in a compliance program, the typical one below a gig is 100. The ones you have in the field will probably do just fine without truck rolls, which is another key benefit of this kind of style. Um, the, one other comment about the speed test servers is they have very, very high capacity. We've done a lot of testing to make sure the server is never a bottleneck and we've never been able to even get it to the point where the server network is a bottleneck. I'm going to actually switch and just show you the real thing um, on how to use it. And so I'm going to bring up my browser. So this is the user services care environment. Um, I'm actually going to briefly open in our dashboard to show you the 5510 that's in our lab that we've done some of the data I'm going to show you a little bit on. Um, this care dashboard, the only thing I want to highlight in this slide today is it has a, a download test button, an upload test button, 
Uh, we did this a little bit earlier today, um, and you can see uh, this is on a one by one uh, fiber network in, in the lab that we have in Austin, but this is testing with the same speed test server I just explained um, from that lab connection. And um, just over a gig, on the performance um, down and uh, like 926 or, or so up. So we've had, uh, I'll show you some data from our one of our key customers that will be from in the field real testing as well in a moment. And go back, I'm gonna open the compliance tool. So the compliance tool is its own application. It's got a web portal uh, for scheduling jobs and for uh, importing the locations you want to test um, the import is actually a CSV file format. The CSV file format um, has information that our server needs to know whether or not um, the reporting location, well, the testing location is going to be part of your FCC reporting or not. Um, one of the things that uh, Jake mentioned briefly is once USAC tells you the locations that you need to test, you have to supply all your test data. You can't run a test for a week and say, oh, I want to do something different to make it come out better. So what we've provided is an option to say, uh, use exactly the same tools for other locations that are not part of your reporting obligation. And so that way you can do tests on those locations. Um, but you import this, this file, uh, you basically put in the subscriber IDs and you use act parlance. Um, the hub IDs are not currently part of this imports format by a couple of weeks from now, they will be. Um, we've been working with our members to be sure we have this option to just put in your hub IDs that are how locations are identified. All these other fields in the CSV are optional. Um, you know, once, once you've identified the subscriber, that's all the tool needs to know. But the same tool also generates the export. So we wanna make sure we faithfully have the data in the tool that is needed for the correct um, USAC export. I'm gonna import that file. So I just pick the file and open it. <clears throat> then I'm gonna import it. And you'll see down here a little progress bar that shows that it's doing the import and it says successfully uploaded. Um, to see what I've, um, well, before I do that, I'm going to show you how you add jobs. So we have a job scheduler. Now our ACS has some very sophisticated tools for scheduling background jobs to do things like firmware updates or various provisioning tasks or configuration management tasks too. But we wanted this to be able to stand alone without having to use any of the rest of those tools in our ACS. So we support um, four kinds of jobs, latency tests and speed tests for both FCC designated locations and other locations. Um, so if we wanna schedule a job, and so let's do a speed test for non FCC locations. You say when you want it to start. Now, typically the when it starts to meet for an FCC job, you would pick a date like the 25th um, because you wanna pick a Sunday. Um, and the other thing is we decided to leave this flexible, but if you're going to do a job that's going to be an FCC compliance test, it has to be 6 p.m. And these are automatically adjusted to your local time area, basically. Uh, how many days to run? Seven. That's, you know, start on Sunday. You run the entire week. Uh, the number of hours to run is six if you're going to do the uh, actual FCC compliant tests and you hit save. And now that's added to the list. Um, that one's set to start on the 25th. It'll run for seven days and it's been queued. Now to see uh, the, the status of, you know, what have you got going on? The first thing is to use the open locations um, dashboard report. And uh, in fact, we've got one um, that is exactly what did you just import in the CSV. So this is what's stored in the database for things to be run and um, what you set for things like download speeds and so forth. If you need to correct anything, you just do that same import process again with the information uh, corrected and it will write over that information. As far as uh, finding results, there's a lot of categories of interactive reports that are both visual, uh, just to give you one that's an example. So here's download speed re report. 
And in this example, you can see that what we've done is if you've got these three speed tears in your test plan, um, and the other, you'll see them color coded, and then it's got a little mouse over. So this is a nice visual tool. And just like USAC looks in aggregate, this is in aggregate. So this is all of the test events that have happened during the time period um, that you're looking at. And um, to give you an example of um, that, here's one of the things for speed, for example, if you wanna look at the speeds a summary for the last 90 days. This is all the things that you've loaded and have been running. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open this uh, fi um, 5510 that we have in our lab. And this has, this is kind of a, a tool to browse through what will go in your USAC export because all the test events um, are in this report. And you can look at any, you, it has a summary of results. So by the way, this environment has some that are below this because we've been using this for testing. So we're doing things to cause loading to make sure that we're getting data that reflects that. Uh, so let me open one of these points where it shows the details of the test event. It shows we've got 40 parallel connections. So um, it actually is important to get those speed results to have that kind of configuration. And we've got a tool that automatically determines what's the right configuration. It actually does it on the fly during script execution to adjust for this. But one of the nice things supported in Zyxel's devices is a time boundary. So we basically put a big file in the test and we give it 12 seconds typically. And the reason 12 is important is because the FCC actually requires that the test duration for a download or upload test is 10 to 15 seconds. Um, and so this is a convenient way to do that. Um, and it, it works very nicely. So I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, move back to the slides and show you some data that has been taken by one of our members that were has been working with us uh, for some time now doing this. So th they're using the EX5510. They've got this on a one by, you know, 1,000 by 1,000 um, service location, and they've been taking data with this tool, um, and they're one of the customers we're working with uh, closely in how we work with USAC on things like exports uh, for USAC as well. Uh, so you can see we've got very consistent uh, results at, you know, in the 900 plus range using this on a real fiber access network. Um, and I believe this is at a friendly location, but it's out in the real network. Um, so this kind of detail is, is really a, a great result. Um, this shows some of the latency details. So again, this was opening the last 90 days latency report. You can see a little bit of the details of the event. Um, when they ran this, it was on four different speed tiers. So we've got four different color codes, all of them very handily meet the 100 millisecond requirement that's pretty independent of the speed tier. So I think the last slide uh, for my presentation is the export tool. It includes a tool that meets the data requirements. This data requirement from USAC is essentially the CSV format they specified, and it is in the documentation, not the links we shared also. <clears throat> all test events, all skip events, all of the location IDs, all the result codes for any issue. So our, t our test tool, if there's one of the examples of a skip, um, they have something they call crosstalk. So if the traffic right prior to the test event exceeds 64K, they allow you to skip and retry later. I think it's 20 seconds later. Um, by the way, 64K is awfully low on most services that our members have. Um, so our default is we set that higher at like 500K. Otherwise, webcams and things like that, you might not get enough data to be compliant because you still have to get 80% including if you had to skip and you didn't manage to get another one, maybe that uh, gateway's offline, for example. So that, those, all those error reasons are recorded in the test event results. And we have a field that's specified in USAC for comments. So we use the comments to give a little bit of color to what the issue was, whether it was traffic 
Um, they also have some error codes in that format. So we've got all those details covered for you uh, if you use our tool for doing the um, uh, compliance testing. Uh, I showed you a little bit of the re report viewers um, that go with that. And um, the URL that's here is the data format guide that is what our export tool supports. <clears throat> and so with that, um, I'll uh, turn this back and uh, I imagine we're gonna be moving to questions shortly. And I'll get rid of my share. Yes. All right, uh, we have one question. Uh, well, we have a couple questions. Um, can you clarify where exactly a test server would be set up to comply in the ISP with an internet connection or hanging up the ISP's network router at the internet meet point? So it's very important that the um, speed test server be located either physically literally right there, like in a colo, right inside the IXP facility. I mean, if you haven't seen an IXP or are not real familiar with, it, it's essentially a, a peering connection point. Um, it, it's similar to walking in a server facility with a bunch of racks, you know, with a bunch of patch panels and things where fiber meets fiber and things of that nature. You can, if you wanna do a traditional, um, like a Linux server or something of that nature, you need to put it literally right there at that internet exchange point. Or if you have a facility that you can get a direct path, um, it doesn't have to be in the same building, but it has to not go out over the internet some other way. Otherwise you can't be sure of the traffic path. Now the implementation we have is, uh, is actually um, a server network that's built predominantly to do things like video streaming services. Um, it's actually a, a full nationwide system. Um, they have um, in this network, the equivalent of putting something right in the exchange point, but it's not a physical server. Um, the concept um, uses the way the BGP network works that once you get to the ASN connection point of that internet exchange point, um, you don't have other hops or intermediaries to get to our speed test server. So um, it is actually a distributed server network. It effectively has uh, a little physical connection point that's part of that. Um, and we are literally, these servers are literally in every exchange point in the, in the US. Great. Thank you. All right, so um, another question. Can I use the NISC CAP solution if we already use a different ACS? Well, it's easiest to use it if you're using USS as the ACS uh, and all of our customers currently that are using our CAP solution are using our ACS. Um, it is actually possible um, to do something as you're asking. Um, the way that is done, there's only really two ways. One is you would have to, on the say 50 or 100 locations, you would have to use our ACS to manage their gateway. That's not really in practice very practical. So there is another option that I think would be practical, which would be um, you can use something like one of those Axel routers to connect behind the current internet gateway you have at your subscriber locations that you have to do testing. Um, these routers all support NAT traversal with STUN to user services system. So the CAP solution that's running can do that speed testing execution from a different device that's connected inside the home. That means, uh, by the way, we have auto provisioning, so it would be feasible to just mail it out or deliver it and the customer could hook it up themselves. But I think most of the operators probably would do a truck roll. That solution is essentially identical to a white box solution. If you're not using USS as your ACS, you can still use the solution we provide um, in the means I, I just described. Okay, since we don't have much time, Art, we're, um, uh, we'll do one more question. Why do some vendors say you cannot use TR143 for cap testing 
Yeah, I think I, I think I actually answered that in my slide, but I think the the key point there is um, a lot of the implementation approach that's been looked at is some of the other speed test server options that I think have they may have fees associated with the servers themselves, uh, things of that nature, or they might be using servers. I'm not going to mention specific names, but there are speed test server solutions where they've located at at IXP's particular servers using proprietary technology. Um, I think the key message for for this presentation is it's not at all necessary to use proprietary technology. Um, using the kinds of CPE that are available from Zyxel, you don't have to swap out to some more expensive CPE to do most of your testing. Again, I think the vast majority of locations are probably a hundred meg testing requirement. And given that, such, I'm talking about today. By the way, RDOF, it's our understanding there's incentives in RDOF uh, to do gig. Um, so a lot of the grant are, you know, proposals that were offered by operators under ACAM and CAF2 um, were probably submitted at 100, like 100 by 25 or 100 by 20, um, because it wasn't really needed to go faster to get the grant money, even if you were doing fiber. Um, so I think in that sense, uh, this kind of solution using TR143 is really ideal because you may be lucky and find, you know, you don't even have to replace any of your CPE for the locations that you have picked. Um, if you do, um, you know, it's, it's also not hard to do with, with the tools we've got available. Great. That's a great answer. All right. So I think um, we're going to announce the winners. Um, shall we do that, Jay? Yes, please, Rochelle. Thank okay. you. Okay, yeah. great. Wonderful. This All right. most exciting part of the webinar. That is the most exciting <laughs> part. All right, drum roll. Okay. Okay, great. So the, the, the winners are Jean Hamilton and Carl Conrad. Congratulations, guys, and I turn it back to you, Jay. Sure. Uh, so, by the way, the prize uh, the, the, uh, is uh, we're giving away our latest Wi-Fi 6 uh, gigabit wireless gateways. Uh, so, the ones that uh, were tested by ARC. So, I mean, you can uh, use it for home Wi-Fi and, uh, you know, hopefully uh, you'll have great experience. Uh, so with that, thank you all, and uh, thank you, Art, uh, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, we would, uh, if you have any further questions, please contact us. Uh, and uh, as always, thanks, Rochelle, for being a great host. Uh, you guys have a great rest of your weekend. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Thank you all, and uh, thank, uh, congratulations to the winners again, and uh, that wraps up our webinar today. We'll see you on our next webinar and have a great weekend. Thank you.